This is the second lecture uh, on the basic lessons to be found in Heidegger's uh, monumental Being in Time. Uh, last time we were talking about the existentials of Dasein, the list of characteristics that we use to describe the being of Dasein, as opposed to the categories, uh, the terms and characteristics we use to describe what Heidegger calls being present at hand, or objects, or beings otherwise than the kind of being that Dasein has. Dasein, again, being uh, Heidegger's word for you and me, meant to defamiliarize ourselves with ourselves so that we can learn something about ourselves uh, afresh. So uh, being in the world, uh, uh, we talked about being in, and the in of Dasein is different from the in of coffee in a coffee cup. The in of Dasein is a kind of dwelling. Well, what, is, what does world mean then? Uh, Heidegger says there are four ways uh, that we can think about the meaning of the word world. Uh, the first would be, world would be like a big bucket of objects, the totality of things. And this would be an ontic uh, understanding. In other words, it would be a list of all the entities, the little b beings that there happen to be in the cosmos. Uh, and we would use uh, categorical, categorical language for thinking about these various little b beings. It's a report on what there happens to be present at hand. And then uh, aligned with that is the world in the sense of the ordering or the collection of those particular little b beings. So this would be world in an ontological kind of sense. Again, using categorical terms to understanding these little b beings that are present to hand. Uh, it's, it's a determination of what it would count to be one of those entities, one of those little b beings, one of those beings present to him. And we talked in the last lecture about regional ontologies. Well, this would be uh, that uh, process, the world of mathematics. The world of mathematics is, would be what would it take for a thing to be let's say, of interest uh, in, the, in the world of math. What does it take to be a mathematical kind of an entity? Uh, or the animal world. What does it take to be the kind of thing that counts as an animal as opposed to a, a plant or a, a mineral or something like that? So this is the ontological structuring uh, of the kinds of things we would find in, in the world in the sense one, a, a big bucket of objects of various kinds. But there's a third understanding of, of world. A world as a specified set of concerns. We learned that uh, term last time. That's, a, uh, again, uh, in the sense, in an ontic sense. Oh, the, the meaning like uh, the world uh, that we live in, the world in which we dwell. And there, there are a lot of those. Uh, there happen to be a lot of those ontically. There's the business world, the world of sports. Uh, you know, that we use the phrase, you know, welcome to my world. Uh, we don't mean welcome to my big bunch of objects. And the business world is not a big bunch of objects present to hand. They're, they're a world of particular kinds of concerns. Just like the world of sports is a, is a different world with a different set of concerns. And, and uh, you know, my world is different from your world uh, at, at home and our, our domestic uh, environment. So again, this is an ontic uh, sense. It's the worlds there happen to be, the concerns that there happen to be. Uh, so it's now not discussed in a uh, categorical sense, but in that existential sense that we learned about last time, a manifestation of, of uh, a certain ontological structure. And that leads us to world in the sense of worldhood. This is the ontology of the many ontic worlds that humans find themselves engaged in and concerned with. And again, we use existential language here uh, to talk about uh, what it takes to count as a world. What, what are the structural features of Dasein that give rise to the world in sense three? Uh, and I, I, want, I want you to notice something. There's, you know, in number two, we said that there's the, the world of math. Number three would be the world of the mathematician. You hear the difference? The world of math is what kind of objects present to hand uh, would, would count as mathematical things rather than other kinds of things. World in sense three, the world of the mathematician would be what it's like to be living a Dasein way of being 
as, say, a mathematician rather than as a basketball player or uh, an, an artist or a parent, something like that. So uh, it's the, the a priori character of worldhood in general. A priori means the, the conditions of possibility for there to be these various ontic worlds. Uh, and, they, and this belongs, note, strictly to Dasein, never to a kind which belongs to entities present in the, in the, in, at hand in the world. The world in, there, there can be worlds in sense three because of the ontological existential structure of Dasein, the makeup of Dasein. Only Dasein are worldly beings. Now you say, wait a minute, aren't there uh, trees and, and cars and so forth in the world? Yes, in our world, which means our world of concerns, of course there are trees and, 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 and cars and houses and so forth, but there's no world for a car. There's no world for a number. Those beings are worldless, Heidegger would say. Beings present to hand have no world. They're not worlded beings. World at all is a function of the ontological structure of Dasein. It's in our makeup that there be a world. Now, again, you've got to be careful with what he's saying here. He's not saying if Dasein were to... I don't know, every, let's say the only Dasein, the only beings whose being are concerned to it happen to be human beings on planet Earth. And God forbid the planet Earth is struck by a, you know, a meteor and all of human life is wiped out. There's no more. You, you think, well, wait a minute, something would be left. You know, there would be devastation, but there'd still be a planet. There'd still be the moon. There'd still be the sun. You know, there, 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 wouldn't, wouldn't there? But there would be no world, right? There would be nobody there to be of be concerned with the sun and the moon and, and, and of course, the devastation. There'd be nobody left to be concerned. Without concern, no world, right? So this is not idealism. It's not saying things only exist so long as, you know, human or a superhuman mind thinks them. That's idealism, what there are ideas. How do you think there's rocks and trees and cars and moons and suns? like a normal person would think, uh, not like like a philosopher like Hegel might think or Bar Bishop Barclay might think. No, he, he, he's, if you want to put it this way, he's a realist. It's not, the, not a good way to put it because realism is kind of a flip side of idealism uh, and Heidegger doesn't want to talk like that. But in a sense, he said, look, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying there aren't these objects, but they don't come to light. He likes to think of Dasein as kind of a, a, a place, really, where things get disclosed, where things come to light. He uses a metaphor later on uh, as a clearing in which things become apparent, f phenomenal, uh, and, and th therefore objects of concern because of Dasein's structure as concern. So Heidegger's book is talking about three and four. One and two is not something he's very interested in in this particular book. He's really interested in the, 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 our, our lived world in number three, but there can only be worlds like that ontically because of the ontological nature of Dasein. Worldhood is an existential of Dasein. It's a feature of Dasein. So worldhood doesn't equal nature. They're not identical. Heidegger says that nature cannot account for worldhood, why there's a world. Right. We, 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 you know, non-Heideggerians would say, well, what are, the reason there's a world because it was a big bang, right? Na the natural world did something and went through, you know, 14.7 billion years of cosmic evolution. And, you know, uh, th that's why there's a world today. No. <laughs> Heidegger says, worldhood comes first, right? Only because of a structural feature of the being whose being is a, an issue for it, the being of concern, could we ever derive the concept of nature, that nature could show itself in its natural properties? Uh, uh, the, the point here is that a primordial understanding of being cannot start with science. It's not that science isn't important, it's really important, but it doesn't come from a vacuum. It comes from uh, uh, Dasein's concernful dealings with the world. If there were no Dasein, there would be no world, and if there were no world, there certainly, certainly wouldn't be anything like science. Um, so he's just trying to show where science comes from and how it's founded, and the point being we should not 
when trying to figure out who we are, we should not defer strictly, solely to physics, anatomy, biology, and so forth in trying to understand ourselves. We don't reduce to those scientific theoretical approaches. They can be quite handy because handiness, readiness to hand, usefulness, pragmatics, that's our first way in the world, not the other way around. So you can sort of see the, the, the comparison here with traditional metaphysics, uh, nature uh, is the object of investigation, whereas for Heidegger, it's the world, which is a feature of Dasein. Uh, traditional metaphysics, which grounds uh, the, you know, what we call the natural sciences, looks at things as substances describable by the categories. Heidegger thinks the world is a world of equipment, a function of equipmentality. Uh, the, the readiness to hand of things because of Dasein's concern. For traditional metaphysics, theoria, a gazing upon things in a disinterested, dispassionate sort of way uh, is the way to get to the truth of things. Heidegger thinks uh, not at all. Uh, for Heidegger, the concernful utilization of things, the practical, pragmatic, uh, uh, praxis-oriented approach to the world gets us closer to how things are fundamentally or primordially. Uh, a lot more emphasis on the affect rather than just on the rationality in Heidegger. Uh, traditional metaphysics and science says you have to put your affect away, you have to put your emotions to the side if you want to get things clear. Heidegger says you'll never get things as they really are if you set your affect away, as we're going to see. Traditional metaphysics, according to Heidegger, and maybe probably according to metaphysics, is you got to do something to get to a position where you could look at your surrounding environment that way. You have to put yourself in a certain frame of mind to look at objects as if they were just sitting there all by themselves. Uh, you know, when you when you first encounter, say, a piece of furniture, uh, it's it's something that you you work on, it's or sit on or sleep on. When you get to school. When you take yourself out of that world where you're working on your table or sitting on your chair or sleeping on your bed, when you get to school, school is going to tell you, I don't care what you use these things for. They're made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. You don't first encounter a big pile of protons, neutrons, and electrons in the world. You encounter chairs and tables and beds, right? So we are already in a position for grasping things as ready to hand. We are, that's, that's how we are in the world primordially or primarily. Uh, and, and to get to science or to get to what we now call traditional metaphysics with all of its uh, confusion, according to Heidegger, you got to do something. you got to step out of your world uh, and get into some kind of uh, so-called utopian no place where you can look at things that way. Not that that doesn't have, again, some advantages, uh, many advantages, but the point is to remember that it's a founded mode of looking at the world. So that takes us back to this idea of spatiality again. We talked about that in the last lecture, about the idea of, of closeness and distance and what comes first, the, the quantifiable measurement in feet and inches and miles, or concern. Uh, uh, and spatiality is another feature of Dasein. You know, traditional uh, scientific, like Newtonian science, tends to picture a world as a giant size container uh, and uh, called space, and there's a bunch of objects, Heidegger would call them present to hand, uh, that populate uh, this big giant-sized cosmic container, uh, and that's what space is. For Heidegger, Heidegger, space is not a container. It's a function of concern, which is what Dasein is, not what Dasein has from time to time, but what Dasein is. It's a structural feature of Dasein. Because there's Dasein, there's spatiality. Because of spatiality, you can think about the world in terms of quantified um, measurements. Uh, so Dasein doesn't have space. Dasein is spatial. And Heidegger points out two important features of Dasein's spatiality. The first is what he calls de-distancing, and this goes to what we were talking about before. Uh, de-distancing means bringing close. Uh, the, 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 the idea that I'm, I'm closer to my grandchildren than I am to the UPS guy that's always on my doorstep during these uh, uh, difficult times. Um, uh, it's because of my concerns, because of the, 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 the engagement uh, and, and even passion and engagement that I have with my, my world. Uh, and then there's the, the other aspect which he talks about, which is directionality. 
uh, and we're we are we, he, he he puts it we, we carry our left and right along with us. Those are uh, not absolutes, but refer to a certain embodied orientation that we have in our environment. And Heider talks about this somewhat, but the the existentialist so-called thinker who who really, if you get into embodiment and the phenomenology of embodiment. The, the, who you want to read is Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Maurice Merleau-Ponty is a friend of Sartre's and, and Simone de Beauvoir, uh, an important thinker in his, in his own right. Your, uh, the text that I, textbook that I asked you to take a look at in this course uh, um, uh, talks about him to a, a, you know, a certain extent. Uh, very important thinker, uh, does, does, really does the, the most for this idea of embodiment. I have a, a, a friend of mine uh, who went to grad school with me, he worked on his uh, doctoral degree on the philosophy of Merleau-Ponty and dance. Uh, this, this friend of mine was b- both a very talented philosopher and a, and a pretty good dancer and musician. So um, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, he's, he's the guy you want to talk about. Um, Heidegger uh, talks about the body to, to a certain extent, but, but I, I, you know, my own two cents worth, I, I think he f- doesn't take that nearly as far as he should, as far as somebody like uh, Merleau-Ponty did. Uh, but it means we have an orientation in the world. We have a, 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 a direction uh, that, that is going to be tied uh, to temporality. Spatiality is going to be tied to temporality. And that sounds maybe a little bit like Kant, who we talked about, the idea of the two sensuous intuitions of space and time. Um, uh, Heidegger is doing something a little bit uh, differently. He, uh, Kant called those part of the structure of reason, because what we are is a rational being. Uh, Heidegger says, no, what we are is our, our pragmatic beings. We're beings who do things. And the theoretical ideas we have of space and time are derived from, abstracted from, pulled out of our worldly engagement with our uh, equipment, uh, as Heidegger calls it. So, all right, with all that under our belt, then Heidegger raises a question that should seem odd at this point. He says, okay, Dasein's not a what, Dasein is a who. But who is Dasein? Who is Dasein? Well, the easy answer is, why well, am? Didn't you tell me that? Dasein is in each case mine. Dasein is the being who says I. So aren't I Dasein? Um, and Heidegger says, well, not so fast. What we mean by I is a self, a thing that remains identical over time. A thing, something present to hand. So when, so when we say, well, I am Heidegger says, well, it all depends what you mean by I. If you mean that the I is something that stays the same throughout all the many changes that you've gone through from the time of your birth to this moment today, if you mean it's there's some kind of substantial something or other, like a thinking thing or a rational structure or an immortal soul or something like that, uh, that just is one of the things in the big bucket of, 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 of items, little b beings in the world, according to world definition number one. Heidegger says, that's what you mean. Uh, you need to think again. All right? Uh, I mean, is, is that really what's given an I without a world and without others that somehow remains constant? What even is that besides maybe a fantasy? Heidegger says that I, that that I, is what he calls merely formal. He calls it a formal indicator. It indicates something. There's no content to that I that is theoretically what you're supposed to be, this I. It's a contentless abstraction or, or even fantasy. It's the kind of thing that Husserl wanted to study in his formal phenomenology, that eidetic reduction. You know, remove everything that's idiosyncratic, strip away through these imaginative uh, manipulations and this naked something or other that you have left is supposed to be the I. Heidegger says, I I don't even know what they're talking about. Whatever this I is, really is, it's got to be examined existentially as the, as really a who, not categorically as a kind of a a what smuggled back in again. So he he asks this question, does the ontical I, you know, the I that I've actually become, the, the I that you've actually become, does that really reveal the who of Dasein, Dasein being 
being with a big B, a way. Does that really reveal or disclose the who of Dasein? And then he writes on his own page 115, it could be that the who of everyday Dasein just is not the I myself. What? I thought Dasein was in each case mine. How could it, how could the who of every day Dasein not be the I myself if Dasein ontologically, existentially, that's one of the existentials, in each case mine, ye mine kite. What? Well, Heidegger says, well, look, ontologically, we are characterized, one of our existentials is ye meinigkeit, to the each case minus. Yes, yes. Ontically, though, is it true? Am I really my own? That's the question. Am I really my own? Do I manifest my own? Is the I that I am really mine? So he writes, perhaps when Dasein addresses itself in the way which is closest to itself, and it always says, I am this entity, and in the long run says this loudest when it is not this entity. Dasein is, is in each case mine, and this is its constitution. You know, its structure, it's, it's existential. But what if this should be the very reason why, proximally and for the most part, he just means usually, Default mode, as I like to put it. Maybe this should be the very reason why the default mode, Dasein, is not itself. What if the aforementioned approach, starting with the givenness of the eye to Dasein itself, and with a rather patent self-interpretation of Dasein, should lead the existential analytic, which is what we're doing, this investigation, what if that, if we start with the ontic Dasein, what if that leads us into a pitfall? If I look at people and I say, well, who are you? And they say, I'm me. I'm the me that I become. Like, oh, maybe I should go with that. Heidegger says, be careful. It may, that may lead us astray. Right? The eye is this formal indicator, meaning that it is pointing at something of a certain ontological nature. That's je meinigkeit, this each case minus. But how it gets filled out might actually hide what that being is really all about. Uh, now we got now we have a mystery going right formally i should be my own but actually am i All right the i is possibilities not actualities it doesn't have a set predetermined uh, uh content i'm going to be what i might be okay well what might i be is that mine are those possibilities really mine where are those possibilities coming from what are the limitations on those possibilities Another way to put this is, our ontic I, the person that you are and think you are today, and the person that I am and think I am today, is a construction. It's a construction. It got constructed. The question's going to be, who did the constructing? Where did the construction come from? In every choice we make, in every act we undertake, in everything we do, we are constructing the I that we are. How are those choices being made? How are those decisions being made? That's what Heidegger wants to ask about because the answer to that will tell us who is Dasein. So Heidegger wants to say, look, we need a new strategy. Remember, remember those two first existentials we learned? Je meinigkeit, Dasein is each case mine. He says, be careful with that because if I say, who is Dasein, you're going to tell me that existential back to me. You say, oh, well, it's in each case mine. It means it's I myself. He says, focus on the other one that I told you about. Dasein's essence is existence. What it is to be Dasein is about this kind of standing out and making choices and making decisions and having a stance and having our being be an issue for us, our being mattering to us. So let's, let's go with that. So I, I know the answer is I, but it doesn't tell me very much. It's just kind of an empty answer. Let's, let's go with this other idea. And that leads us to another existential of Dasein, again, a feature of Dasein called, that Heidegger names being with other Dasein, or uh, being with others. He said, in our circumspective, concernful engagement with the environment, right, our umsicht in the umwelt, right, our circumspective engagement with the environment, the world in sense three, and listen, you, you want to write this down. You, you definitely want to know this. When Heidegger says world in this book, 
almost, unless he's specifying something else, he means a referential system of significance. Remember the, the, the carpenter in the, in the shop? Everything is what it is as a meaningful tool, as a being ready to hand, with reference to everything else in the shop. Hammers are hammers because of nails and boards and, and, and uh, books and, and readers. That's the world, a referential system of significance. Uh, and he says, in that referential system of significance, we discover other Dasein, right? The carpenter realizes the nails were made by somebody else. The lumber was harvested f uh, for the boards by somebody else. The bookcase is for, for a customer. Each other Dasein has particular concerns, shaping a whole set of interconnected choices and actions. In other words, they're worldly, right? They have a a referential system of concerns and significance. Being with other Dasein or being with others is another existential, ontological, structural feature of any Dasein. Uh, no being with others, whatever you got there, is not a Dasein. My coffee cup has does not have that way of being with others. Coffee cup has no world. <laughs> Dasein are worldly beings. Right? Now think about this. Dasein is always with others even on a deserted island, right? These are these wonderful uh, uh, insights that Heidegger makes. Remember, remember the one we talked about, a, you know, the, the, the book can't touch the table, the chair can't touch the wall. Touching is about an encountering that's only possible with a certain way of being that Dasein has and nothing else does. Same thing here. Dasein is always with others, even on a deserted island. He would say if you were by yourself on a deserted island, that would be a particular ontic, existential mode of being with others. A way to manifest your being with others. I'm with others by keeping the heck away from them. Right? Social distancing is a way of being with others. Even if we distance by halfway around the globe. That's our way of being with others. That's what Heidegger is talking about. Uh, that's why some people are never lonely when they're physically alone but others are lonely even in a crowd. Because right? lonely is a, a way of being with others, even if they're standing right next to you, feet and inches away. Heidegger writes on his page 118, thus in characterizing the encountering of others, one is again still oriented by that Dasein, which is in each case one's own. But even in this characterization, does one not start by marking out and isolating the I so that one must then seek some way of getting over to the others from this isolated subject? That's Descartes. I'm in here, you're out there, how do we connect? How do I even know you're really there? Big problem, says Descartes. No problem, says Heidegger. To avoid that misunderstanding, we must notice in what sense we're talking about the others. By others, we do not mean everyone else but me, those over against whom the I stands out. They are rather those from whom, for the most part, one does not distinguish oneself. Those among whom one is too. This being there too with them does not have the ontological character of being present at hand along with them in the world. Right? I'm not just parked next to them. This with is something of the character of Dasein. Right? It's a structure of Dasein. The two means a sameness of being as circumspectively concernful being in the world. With and to are to be understood existentially, not categorically, not something on the map beings present in hand just parked next to each other, but the way of Dasein's concern. By reason of this with-like being in the world, the world is always the one that I share with others. The world of Dasein is a with-world. Now, this leads us to well, maybe the most famous section of Being in Time, section 27, and this idea of the they. So, uh, every day being oneself, the way we normally are, how are we, who are we normally, usually, and what Heidegger refers to as the they. Uh, remember, we just learned that it could be that the who of everyday Dasein just is not I myself. Well, if it's not I myself, who is it? Uh, before I say anything more, just for you uh, scholars, uh, 
uh, Heidegger basically cribs this, this set of insights from Shirin Kierkegaard's The Present Age. Uh, you might uh, Google that. It's a, a short um, uh, text by uh, Kierkegaard, but uh, Heidegger, uh, although he, he does have a footnote to Kierkegaard in the, in the book, uh, this is he takes a lot of that from a lot of this is Kierkegaard uh, without Heidegger thanking him uh, for the insights. Uh, all right, so uh, what's part of this? Uh, let's go back to a, a feature of spatiality, distantiality. What Heidegger means by distantiality here now is the care Dasein has regarding its distance. Remember, that's not feet and inches how close or far it is concernfully from others, how it differs from others. Heidegger thinks that we are always in a way kind of sizing each other up, seeing what everybody else is doing, right? And the, the other piece of this uh, is what he calls subjection, which is one's own being, being one's own, being oneself, is being taken away by others. How so? Well, you put them to put them together here, and distantiality, this concern with the other, what they're doing, how they're doing it, how am I doing it compared to how they're doing it, and you put that together with subjection, turns out that I am the they. I, the I that's making choices, the I that's deciding is deciding in the way they do, or the way one does. He writes on 126, but this distantiality which belongs to Dasein with is such that Dasein, as everyday being with one another, stands in subjection to others. It, it, it itself is not. Its being has been taken away by the others. Dasein's everyday possibilities of being are for the others to dispose of as they please. These others, moreover, are not definite others. On the contrary, any other can represent them. What is decisive is just that inconspicuous domination by others. I highlighted that passage. The inconspicuous domination by others. We're dominated by others, but we don't notice it. Which has already been taken over unawares from Dasein as being with. One belongs to the others oneself and enhances their power. The others whom one thus designates in order to cover up the fact of one's belonging to them, essentially oneself, are those who proximally and for the most part, that's usually default mode, are there in everyday being with one another. The who is not this one, not that one, not oneself, not some people, not the sum of them all. The who is the neuter, the they, in German das Mann, which is the way Germans would say one. We do things the way one does them. You know what they say? They say you shoot your vegetables. Yeah, well, where are they? Who are they? Where's their office? What's their email address? Can I Zoom with them? I want to talk to they. I want to, who is the one who says one should eat one's vegetables? Which one are we talking about? It's, it's, it's nobody. It's nobody in particular. But we all talk like that. Well, they, they, they say you should, uh, you know, watch this new show on Netflix, right? One, one, one doesn't go out without a mask these days. That's not what one does. That's the way we talk, right? That's the they. Uh, and this they uh, uh, orders our choices, decisions, the way we look at things, the way we like things. And a lot, most of the time, we don't know that that's happening. Heidegger says, in utilizing public means of transport and in making use of information services like the newspaper, let me come back to that. You still got a newspaper? <laughs> every other is like the next. So everybody's going along throughout their day in their world uh, on a common transport. They're moving together. And they're all sitting there on the bus, whatever, reading their newspaper. So everybody's thinking about what the newspaper says is good to think about. And the newspaper puts in there what they think one should be talking about. Uh, and in that sense, Heidegger says, everybody starts to be like the next one. They, every, we all start to become kind of interchangeable. And, and, and that's what he thought with this technology this information technology called a newspaper that was printed on paper and dropped on people's doorsteps or sold at kiosks on, in the, at the bus stop. What would Heidegger think of the internet? 
Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. I mean, what would he think? Right? How, how do you become you when that's all you're taking in? He continues, this being with one another dissolves one's own Dasein completely into the kind of being of the others, in such a way indeed that the others, as distinguishable and explicit, vanish more and more. In this inconspicuousness and unascertainability, the real dictatorship of the they is unfolded. Dictatorship. We take pleasure and enjoy ourselves as they take pleasure, or as one takes pleasure. We read, see, and judge about literature and art as they see and judge. Likewise, we shrink back from the great mass as they shrink back. We find shocking what they find shocking. The they, which is nothing definite, and which all are, though not as the sum, prescribes the kind of being of everydayness. Averageness. Right is the being of the they. I mean, take take a, a class. Let's suppose we have t- twenty people in the class. This this will not pertain to you. Let's suppose we had a class twenty people. Ten of those people take a test and they get a one hundred percent. Ten of the the other ten people take the test. They get a zero. They can't answer a single question right. So what's the average grade for the course? The answer is it's a fifty. But no human actually gets a fifty. You can't say, well, you know, what about that class? What's the average? What do people average get, you know, the average people get in that class? Well, 50. What can you know about that exactly? You can get 100 or nothing. Even though nobody, no actual human being gets a 50, we say that's the average. Heidegger is thinking like that. There's no actual person that's the they. There's no actual person that's the one. And yet, uh, it's not everybody. It's not exactly nothing because it's very powerful. It exercises a dictatorship in a very sneaky, inconspicuous kind of way. It, it, it has a power over us. It, it, it subjects us to thinking a certain way and choosing a certain way and being a certain way, being the who we are in a certain way. Right? And it leads to a leveling off of anything exceptional, anything different, leads to a reduction of possibilities. Oh, no, no, no. They say you can't do that. No one mustn't do that. It cuts off the possibilities. Heidegger's very concerned about that. And listen, he's not, he's not only, I don't want to say he's not at all, but he's not only being a crank here. He thinks there's something about the modern philosophical, metaphysical, scientific, economic, capitalistic point of view that sees human beings as objects that are interchangeable. That one is as good as another. Anything that makes one one's own is quickly blotted out by a kind of pressure. Now, it's not just peer pressure. A lot of times people hear about the they uh, and they think immediately of a, of a peer pressure where somebody's like, come on, come on, come on, look, come on. You, we're all going. Let's go. You want to study, you know, but all your friends are going out. Come on, we want to go. It's not just peer pressure. It's way more subtle than that. It happens all the time without even thinking about it. You go into a store to buy something to wear to school. You're not hearing a lot of people, come on, I dare you to wear that. Come on, we're all wearing that. No, you go into the store, you look at something that you think will not make you stand out too much. Maybe a little if you're in a mood that day, but certainly nothing too much. right, certain things that are just not done. One does not do them. One does not wear them, (laughs) okay? So uh, Heidegger thinks that the kind of choices and actions we make get leveled off into kind of an average uh, mediocrity. And he thinks it's not, you know, a personal failing on our part. It's just that is our default mode as Dasein in in the world. Uh, He talks about this hegemony of the they. The, The hegemony is the ruling power of the day. He calls that publicness. We, we are public selves. We are what we're willing to go out in public with, with ourselves. And he says that the day is always right because who, who, who else are you going to check with? Uh, that, that's, that's what there is. So this allows Dasein to disburden itself of agency and responsibility. You, you hear that? 
Daseins being is in each case mine, and its existence, which means my being is a, a matter of um, concern to me, my being is an issue for me, I have to choose, I have to decide, and I have to make it my own, which implies responsibility. And yet, our ordinary default mode of being is such that we do what we can to disburden ourselves of genuine agency and responsibility. We do what they they. They say, I mean, I, I tell this story about myself when I was a, a, a freshman, I was just just 16 yeah, years old, uh, going to college for the first time. And I, I, uh, I, and I, you know, I, I, I was in a line, I wasn't, you know, I was young and I wasn't always paying attention. And, you know, so I was in orientation, I was in a line and I, you know, I, I, I turned to the guy behind me and I said, what's this line for? <laughs> and the guy behind me says, well, well, this is the line where you go up there and you pick your major. I said, oh. So I, I tapped the guy in front of me. I said, hey, 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 what's, hey man, what's a good major? <laughs> and the guy says, accounting. And I said, well, okay, <laughs> I'll be an accountant. And I, I just, I didn't, I didn't make that choice of mine. Somebody told me accounting is a good major. One says that accounting is good. Now, it's not, I, listen, I know I have accounting majors out there. Nothing wrong. I'm just, I'm not picking on accounting majors. It doesn't matter what I would have picked, right? If society said philosophy is a good major, I might have picked that at the time, right? That's the point. Whatever they say is what's a good thing to do. Well, that's what we do. That's, that's how things should be. And it allows me to say, well, it wasn't really my choice. Not really my fault. I, that's, that's what one does. You, you pick up, you know, a major that gets you a job. That's what you do. Right. And, and look, the day is very welcoming <laughs> and the day is very accommodating to Dasein. So long as Dasein and Heiger says, quote, takes things easily, like stay chill, you know, do it the way one does, go along to get along and all will be well. The constancy of the everyday self consists in this, that everyone is the other and no one is him or herself. And that's what Heidegger is going to mean by inauthenticity. The they is nobody. The self of everyday Dasein is the they self. Thus, <laughs> if you do the math, if Dasein is usually proximally for the and for the most part <laughs> the default mode, if Dasein is a they self and the they self is a nobody, then Dasein is nobody in particular. The who of Dasein is nobody in particular, as a default mode, in our everyday way of being. We are interchangeable in large part, most of the time. Now, I'm thinking that if you're hearing this for the first time, you may well be bristling. Like, he's not talking about me. I'm not just nobody, and I'm not just everybody else. I'm different. But you're distinguished from others, and you certainly are, in ways that are compatible with the they self. Now, uh, somebody might give me the example of a you know tremendous athlete. I like basketball, so let's, say, let's take LeBron James. Like he's not just interchangeable with any other, even professional basketball player. He's not just interchangeable. With he's somebody special. Yeah, he's somebody special in ways that the world of basketball recognizes as special. If he were special in some other kind of way, like different in some other kind of like way out kind of way, people wouldn't think he's great. People just think he's weird. And nobody wants to be thought too weird. All right, some people push it, uh, and we, we need to talk about them a little bit. But most of us don't do that. He's great in the way one says greatness should be. How about that? Right? Doesn't mean I can be great because I know what one says greatness should be. Only LeBron and people like him can do that. But I, 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 he's great in the way they say great should look. That's what Heidegger's talking about. Uh, so, again, uh, I'm not saying because he says it, it's true, but it's something to consider. If you bristle when he says that, then think it through. What kind of things do you eat? How do you talk? What level of voice do you use when you're talking to another person? Do you talk like this? Or do you talk like that? You talk at a level the way one talks uh, when you're in public. That, all the way down to our bodily gestures, movements, the clothes we put on, the way we turn our heads, all of that. How do you think? is structured by this they-self that we are for the most part. 
That's inauthenticity, as he puts it, a failure to stand by oneself, by one's own, by one's autos, by one's eigen, right? Uh, uh, and, and Heidegger makes a note here. He says, look, to be in this way, which we are, all of us are, for the most part, uh, signifies no lessening of Dasein's facticity, just as the they, as the nobody, by no means is nothing at all. Right? On the contrary, in this kind of being, Dasein is an ens realissimum, you know, in other words, the, it's the most real thing, reality. If by reality we understand a being that has the character of Dasein, right? We, we're still Dasein. That, that's, that's, the, that's maybe the paradox here. You're always Dasein. That's the kind of thing you are. That's your being. That's your way of being. You're Dasein. How does Dasein be most of the time? It, it, it is as a they-self. We are as one is. We are as average, everyday, leveled-down Dasein is. Heidegger gets some of this from you know Nietzsche. I mean, he gets a bunch of it from Kierkegaard, of course, but he gets some of it from uh, Nietzsche. And Nietzsche, you know, he's a guy that always complained about the herd, the herd mentality. Heidegger really protests often in this book that he's not moralizing here. When he talks about a failure to stand by oneself, he's not yelling at us. He's, he's not really chastising us. He's just describing as, as we are. And, and let's think about that for a second. Don't, don't think about you now. Think about you when you were two and you were just learning to read and you're just learning language and um, you're, you're just coming to a kind of an awareness you know, of yourself uh, as, a, as a child. Uh, what else are you going to do? You're going to do what your parents tell you, and your parents are going to look around and see what other parents are doing, and they're going to try to raise you the best that they can and try to teach you the things to say and not say and the things to eat and not eat and the things to touch and don't touch. They're going to, they're going to I mean, how else would you be? If the I is a formal indicator of being a bunch of possibilities that you're always actualizing at any moment, which actualizations are you going to really do? You're going to do what everybody else is doing. That's that's what we do. That's who we are. So Heidegger doesn't think he's really complaining or moralizing or thinking, oh, you know, you, we all need to be you know super special. He's not saying that. He, he this inauthenticity is a is structural. Our default mode, our ontology has it that we're inauthentic. Not authentic. It's not like we were really ourselves once upon a time and then we fell off the cliff into a they-self. No, we're they-self from day one. That That is how we are most of the time. So if you keep that in mind, then when he does talk about authenticity, you got to hear it as some kind of uh, taking over of this normal way of being for our own self. Somehow taking that over. Uh, and, and, and becoming that ontically, like actualizing ourselves in a certain kind of way. Now, we'll have to see what that way looks like. Uh, the they is not a present to hand. Again, they don't have an office. You know, we don't notice them. And in fact, he says, the less we notice the they, the more powerful it's hold over us. Um, again, if you're hearing about this for the first time, uh, you know, it might have been so powerful that you didn't even notice that you were being like this, or I am, and, and, and we all are. I think he's right about that. So the they is a feature of Dasein. It's ontological. It's what. It's the kind of thing that we are. We are they selves. To the extent to which its dominion becomes compelling and explicit, that may change in the course of history. Think about that. So uh, in two ways. One, um, Maybe there have been times where people learn to be themselves better than now. I think Heidegger, I know Heidegger thinks that the modern world, the world that started with Descartes, uh, which is his philosophical opponent, uh, he thinks that world has made it very difficult for us uh, to be authentic, to even know what authenticity is, uh, let alone have it be possible. Uh, and he thinks that that could change again that if we have a new uh, idea of who we are, a new recognition where we see how the they operates, that may uh, help change the course of history as well. So there's something very powerful going on here. Uh, Dasein is for the sake of the they in an everyday manner, and the they articulates the referential context of significance. And if I give you a quiz here, I'd say, give me a one-word synonym for the phrase 
referential context of significance. A one-word synonym. Your answer should be very quickly, world. The they articulates the world. The world of our concerns. What matters to us. What we think we should be bothering with. What we think matters to us uh, in an everyday way. The they is what's articulating that. So even our in order to's are configured by the they. All our projects and, and uh, uh, engagements are configured by that. So authentic Dasein then would have to be an existential, an ontic modification of the they self. If the they self is an existential and the they self is inauthentic, then inauthenticity is structural. We are inauthentic beings. We are selves that aren't selves. That's the paradox. That's the, the, the tricky being of Dasein. To be authentic is something we have to do. We have to actualize certain possibilities uh, in order to have a shot at what Heidegger says, taking ownership of our own being, of Dasein, being authentic. Ontologically, you're Dasein, whether you're authentic or inauthentic. <laughs> Ontically, one might find one's authentic self. Maybe. Possibly. So, who is Dasein? Answer, for the most part, in our average everydayness, Dasein is they. So, let's take another break. We'll come back to it. <laughs> 